John Spencer, I'm very excited to have you here today. I've been uh, following some of your work on urban warfare, and I think people are going to be very excited to hear what you have to say about the future of urban warfare, because you're kind of a, an expert in this. This is what you research all the time. Um, so yeah, can, can you give us an introduction of some of your background? Uh, take it away, John. Hey, Chris, thank, thanks for having me. It's really excited, real big fan of Task and Purpose and all the work that you guys do. So, yeah, I'm John Spencer. I'm the chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute, which is a research center at the United States Military Academy. I have the dream job uh, for many years now. I've been paid uh, just to look at urban operations across all missions that you might give a military from high intensity warfare to disaster relief. I try to cover it all. Uh, I retired in 2018, after 25 years as an infantryman, so I have my own you know, personal experiences from urban warfare, both in my 2008 deployment to Baghdad during the Battle of Sadr City, and I was a part of the evasion in 2003, which had a very urban component to it, because something I've learned in both my military, military experience and in my studies is that you may not have interest in the urban terrain, but it has lots of interest in you. Uh, you cannot avoid it. You cannot bypass it. So I, I try to study and help everybody understand better what it takes to achieve missions, whatever it is, in urban operations. What do you see as some, in the future of urban warfare? What do you think some of the biggest challenges are going to be for the, the next battle? So I think the one of the, the biggest challenges is – being able to fight the way you want to fight in urban terrain. So the ur urban areas have exponentially increased. So we have almost no point of reference to guide our militaries. doesn't matter which military, U.S. military, I can talk in general, on, on what it's going to be like and how big the urban terrain is going to be. There's so many assumptions that we carry forward into the future uh, that may not best prepare soldiers for urban operations and that's kind of my job is kind of expose those assumptions but cities were more urban than we've ever been in history just in 1960 there were only 2.5 billion people living in cities out of the 3 billion on, on the planet today it's over 3.5 billion of the 7 billion so it's over 50 percent most of the world is like 80 percent urbanized you know it, it gets down to in the 50s because you include like Antarctica and Africa and places that that aren't but uh, for me it, it we're going to be pushed asked to do missions in urban terrain bigger than we ever have in the past and granted Baghdad was six million uh, population of six million it's much more now um, but if you look across the globe and where potential conflicts are where we think we're going to fight although we never get that right it's going to be urban uh, and I don't know if I see that and everybody's thinking about you know, I can't just assume that I'm going to fight in urban environments and, and, and think it's going to be what we call mount, right? Military operations on urban terrain, which are just a bunch of empty buildings that we practice on. Uh, the These are thousands, if not millions of people intermixed within the enemy in these operations. And that's really hard to replicate um, for preparing for that type of operation. But that's one of the big ones is that the environment we that we holding our mind as urban isn't the reality of you know, you're in New York City of what it would look like if you actually put military forces into a mega city like that. Mega cities is something that we hear about near pier all the time now. We're also hearing about mega cities now, something we didn't really hear about 20 years ago. But yeah, it's fascinating to think about how, because there is a strategic importance, right? You can't just, so what are some of the reasons why you have to go into a city or examples in the past of um the importance militarily you can't you can't just like, avoid cities right and i i'm a military you know old infantry guy so I, I i agree whenever possible avoid and bypass the urban areas but the problem is that it won't be necessary but if you think about even the your recent wars let's take the, the overthrow of saddam hussein the the strategic objective was get to baghdad and overthrow him, uh, and we we bypassed a bunch of urban areas on the way, and that really stretched out what you call your lines of communication, your lines of supplies. If anybody remembers uh, 
it causes a lot of problem in that battle. But the the, the reasons that they're so important is that cities, especially cities, uh, which are special urban areas, are the economic engines of nations. They are the political centers of nations. They are what we call the centers of gravity. Uh, there are theories about you know if you just destroy the enemy's other army, they will you know capitulate, stop doing what they're doing. But if you think about World War II, it was we were on a path to Berlin. We were on a path to you name it. And we weren't going to the rural field outside Berlin, <laughs> right? Uh, in urban areas, also by the nature of why cities pop up, right? So they're on ancient trade routes. They're on. Uh, ancient ports of connecting sea lines of communication, they pop up where they need to. And usually that's anything that matters to in a military campaign. I need to get somewhere. Well, I'm going to pass through this ancient intersection of trade routes, which like Fallujah, most people don't know Fallujah. And the reason that it's there is because it's an ancient trade route stop for people that people then just decide to make home. You're not going to get anywhere in this world without passing through urban areas. And the problem of the last, let's say, few decades is extremely dense urban areas. One figure I like to throw out that it almost blows the mind, but the United Nations says that 180,000 people move to a city a day. That That's insane. But you, for a military in a campaign, for whatever reason you're there – it usually the the urban area is the objective, the strategic objective. Whether it's overthrow somebody, whether it is to take a vital resource, whether it's to get to it before somebody else does to protect it, um, and you're not going to get to wherever your objective is without passing through urban areas. So I say that the the idea of open terrain warfare, like Kaiser Pass, the, you whatever it is, it's dead. There's no military of the right mind that's going to stand ground against the American army or military in the open terrain. It's going to seek places where it can use its advantage, and that's what we're also seeing. Everybody and their brother in the whole asymmetric war is getting to urban areas, whether you're a terrorist organization or a proxy force. It defeats the, some of our ad, advantages, right? Yeah. So w the U.S. military has advantages in, say, air power. By going into urban areas, it makes it harder to use that air power. It makes it harder to use the technologies that give the United States an advantage, which leads to something interesting about – so we, we were talking we, – we were discussing how maybe Battle Drill 6 could be obsolete or it's not the best maybe way to do near-peer – um, urban battles for infantry, uh, Battle Drill 6, Enter and Clear Room. So maybe call in artillery. But that I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on this very famous quote about urban warfare from, I think it, it might be Vietnam, where some officers said we had to destroy the city in order to save it. Yeah. Have you heard of that quote before? A absolutely. I use it what all What are your time. thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think that that's the nature of urban operations. So that was a you know, a Vietnam officer, major, making a quote about basically taking back a city from um, Viet Cong, named name the organization that has gotten inside of it. And because it's very important to get it back, you have to go in there and get them out. Um, based on what that requires, if you have somebody defending urban terrain, it, it is a very explosive, high-intensity, destructive form of warfare. Uh, so that's what like the Battle of Mosul, 2017, the Battle of Raqqa, the bar all these name a name a battle in World War II or today, um, you're going to think about a city, whether that's the Battle of Aachen, the Battle of Manila, Seoul, and the the amount of damage that's caused to the city is crazy, and and it's because of the nature of close combat in urban terrain. Um, it's not permissive. You need heavy amounts of fire to cover yourself to close the distance to the enemy uh, you, in order to take it. But we're destroying like Mosul in 80% destroyed like $11 billion, depending on who, who, who you, who you guess, but that's also the cost of warfare and all these things matter strategically. Um, you, know, when you ask somebody to do it, like you give one of us, you know, an infantryman, the mission, I'm, I'm going to expend all measures I can to achieve my mission, which is to kill the other guy. Um, it's going to be very destructive to an urban environment. Yeah, it's 
I guess there is no way to go into an urban fight and not destroy the city. Is is that kind of what you're saying? It's sort of. So it, it's that's the right. So that, that's the, the the area of research, the area of study. Of course, it is possible to be less destructive. Um, you, there, there's plenty of I can give you historical examples. Even the the, the Battle of Aachen, where it, it was literally just two battalions um, applied to take the Battle of Aachen, but they also kind of took a method of destroy every building along the route. Um, it's about not about learning how to do urban operations the most effective way. Like we're the greatest military in the world, bar none. And our strength isn't our destructive power. It isn't how much air we can call in, how much precision guided ammunition. It's our ability to combine capabilities all at once, right? All at the point of need, whether that's, you know, engineers, infantry, tank, close air support, you know, it's that ability to combine arms at once. And the problem is if you don't train that, you learn on the fly and we, we figure it out. Um, but I believe strongly that if, if, if a military trained more on large scale combat operations, urban terrain, they could do it less destructively. And I think this is where it really matters, right? Bad things happen in war. Let's, let's face it. There's going to be a lot of things destroyed. A lot of people will die, but it, it, if you get better at it, it becomes less attractive to your enemy to choose that as their terrain, right? It becomes a deterrent. And I kind of try to use trench warfare. Is that, you know, trench, trench warfare was the thing in World War One. It's whoever could dig better and dig their lines closer uh, until it wasn't. And then, and once we figured out shock troop, you know, use of tanks, radio, airplanes, and fast maneuver, if you got in a trench, you were going to die. So, it became we got better at the character of warfare and the care of warfare changed do you think in the way that world war one was about trenches and world war two was about just movement that blitz fast for um mobility do you think world war three might be the an urban battle and an underground battle so i think world war two was the start of modern day urban operations right so fast moving forces highly lethal with combined joint munitions, but able to get to strategic terrain in a campaign, right? So it was literally about who could get to the cities first, who could take the cities, which then control logistical supplies or logistical requirements, right? Because you get most of your your supplies, whether that's you're making tanks or you're making bombs or whatever, you're, you're making them in your cities, right? In their industrial zones. Uh, I think that was a, the start of that. Do I think the future... Is going to be that? Yes. I can't think of a scenario where the main objective won't be some type of joint operation to seize and hold critical terrain, which is going to be urban. And what do you think about the army spending close to like $500 million on training to underground subterranean? I think that was great. And, and we got a lot of things out of that, right? So we, we threw money... Um, through the asymmetric warfare group and sent mobile training teams to every brigade in the U.S. Army and gave them a, you know, what, it, whether you're an engineer or an infantryman, different classes on how to fight underground, which you, you're you not going to find an urban area without an underground component, and you're not going to find a war really where the enemy doesn't know that going underground helps protect them, again, against our air power, against our ISR. Uh, it was fleeting, though, because you and I know for an infantry unit, you, you get a mobile training team, it's going to train everybody there, at that moment in time. And then they're all going to rotate out. Uh, and just by the rotational nature of the army, two years later, you can assume that about 60% of those people are just not in the army anymore. Uh, so I would like to have seen the money being spent on creating a school somewhere like the center, the engineering center of excellence on underground warfare. And the army just pump people through doing train to trainer which we know works. So we have a mountain warfare school. What do we have for as far as urban warfare badge or school? And what are the requirements that every infantryman needs to do w with urban? Yeah, so there's zero. Uh, and you probably know this, right? So there's no school for urban focused on urban warfare in the U.S. military that I know of. The British have a two-week course. Um, I'm helping stand up a uh, an urban planner course, which helps in planning for urban operations but even if we get down to like those infantry skills like close combat infantry skills the only thing we have is battle drill six which is good 
you, you know that I think differently about it than most people. I think it's a it's a counterterrorism, intelligence driven. You need s- surprise, you need speed, and it's great, but it it shouldn't be the first thing people think about in urban operations because if you if an enemy knows you're coming. You're not going to face a guy in a room very surprised that you're there with an AK standing up. You're going to find a, you know, a highly trained, body armored guy behind a bunker he built inside the building, like you have in the past, peer on peer conflicts. There, there is no school. There's a school for desert warfare, jungle warfare, mountain warfare, Arctic warfare. For many reasons, we don't have one for urban. I've been a strong proponent for many years that we should, and anybody could do it. We have a lot of great training sites, but we just we'd have to commit to spending the resources and creating the experts. Because even Battle Drill Six, it's great, um, but you and I know you travel around the army, you're going to see some crazy stuff when people are doing Battle Drill Six. Whether that's the the backwards mule donkey kick of the door to just some crazy stuff, and I've seen that in real life. We had a a sergeant who tried to do that kick the door was locked didn't go anywhere so then we had to shoot the hinge off um battle drill six yeah it's everyone i think we should make a distinction between urban warfare in in almost like a police action like how iraq was after post 2007 it's when when my unit did raids we would go at like three in the morning and kick indoors, get high value targets. Battle Drill 6 worked because they were sleeping most of the time. And you're not in, it's not World War Three. There aren't, like you said, body armor enemy behind the door. You, you have that element of surprise. We didn't have flashbangs, but we had the element of surprise. And, but Battle Drill 6, would it work in when you don't have that surprise, where, you, where you're not doing a surgical raid because you want to get somebody alive. You want to get somebody a, a high-value target, maybe someone who is making bombs in your AO. But that's not going to be the battle that we fight next. No, no. So, you know, I, I mean, CQB close quarters battle is what Battle Drill 6 is. CQB came from 1972 failed raid of the, the Munich, trying to save the Munich, uh, the Israeli Olympians. And then we mm-hmm. created like Delta Force and we created the SGS and all, like around the world, these counterterrorism forces, which developed that, that tactic, which, I mean, it's like, it, it, it gives you goosebumps if you see a unit do it right and with the violence of action and, and everything that it needed to be done. That translated, you know, it, it made its way to the general purpose force and then we superimposed it and it did work in Iraq and Afghanistan, like you said, and I did hundreds of those raids as well. Um, it, the problem is that usually you don't spend the time to then take that to other environments, right? So what happens when it's a non-permissive environment, when you get snipers all around you and you're snacking on the outside of a door, you have, you know, you're doing an entire area clear and, and the enemy is very well prepared. He knows you're coming. So of course he's going to target the doors and the windows and just shoot at them. Uh, and we're going to – history shows that, that we'll have to adapt. And so you'll have to bring up other things. Instead of stacking on doors, you'll have to bring up your mobile protective firepower to penetrate the building, which you have now identified there's an enemy in there. Um, and what kind of tools does the infantry have to, say, bring down a building? Or what do they, what do they have organic to the squad that could help with something like that? Yeah, very few th- – so we have a few – very little concrete penetrating weapons, right? So it's going to take an inordinate amount of small arms to even touch a concrete wall that's reinforced with rebar. And I'm a huge fan of the Carl Gustav. So there are some units that have kind of implemented that down to the bottom level. And that, that'll that poke a hole in a in a wall like nobody's business or through a window um, and, and really and wake up. you can up fire and, that indoors, right? Yeah, yeah. It's going to rock you, though. I don't know if you ever <laughs> fired it, but it, it, no. Oh, it, I don't. I don't I, more than the AT4, I'm guessing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it it like you can only fire like five or five a day without getting like a heart murmur. It's it's crazy. Um, but the small, I mean, it's just not what we've designed our small units for. So right, we expect them to adapt. So they need to know what is available, what to think about when when entering this high intensity combat that will penetrate a wall. Because why would you try to rush into a room if you know there's a guy? in there waiting for you right you, you and i've talked about you know, the throwing of grenades inside a room that, that's still listed 
It's a big call-out button in doctrine for battle drill six, if in a high-intensity environment, throw in a grenade first. Well, how many grenades does an infantry squad have before it runs out and they've only cleared two buildings and they have a hundred more to clear? Uh, and that's where you you need more grenades than you have five, five, six rounds because five, five, six rounds won't do anything to any very few things in, in an urban environment. So, yeah, the ability to penetrate concrete um, and that whole idea of mobile protective firepower. That's why I'm not a fan of the striker. I haven't never been. It, it never was meant to be a fighting vehicle is meant to be this interim vehicle that we could quickly load onto an airplane and get it somewhere fast. Um, but it is so un under armored under firepowered what, everything. What round do you think is sufficient to go through concrete? Is it 25 millimeter, 30 millimeter yeah. tank round? What do you need? Yeah. So it depends on right. It, there's no one city the same, right? So if it's a highly modernized city, the, with some glass yeah i'm gonna plug i i i started 25 millimeters and worked my way up yeah so a 25 millimeter bush max is going to do a lot of things um we found basically using our modern weapons that a 120 millimeter tank is going to be a ve probably one of your most effective assets if you have that in your formation to eliminate an enemy but even then we've seen cases of fortified buildings where you fired everything you got at it and you still have to go in there and close the distance. But that's the problem, right? We Urban warfare is not an infantry fight. It's a combined arms fight. You got to have all of it with you. And if you're going to kick somebody off of urban terrain, one of my favorite uh, kind of case studies for that would probably be the Chechnyan war between Russia uh, where Russia brought a bunch of tanks into an urban environment and basically got their ass kicked. How, since urban warfare is not just an infantry fight, how, what went wrong there? What, how, how, could, how would you prevent that from happening again? Yeah, so that's got its own baggage of the Russians going into Grozny with this overconfidence and, no, the, and underestimating the enemy. So they drove like a parade of tanks into the middle of Grozny, and there were some ex-military Chechens with experience in setting up complex ambushes and using the urban terrain to their advantage using some anti-tank weapons and they just they they eliminated more tanks in that first battle than the germans or the russians lost at the entire battle of berlin uh, it, it was insane because they had underestimated the enemy and underestimated the challenge of urban warfare in general tanks by themselves are too vulnerable in urban terrain we know that that's why you always combine infantry with tank. Infantry is clearing for tanks. Tanks are supporting infantry to penetrate concrete and known enemy locations. But you better have engineers with you as well because if I'm defending urban terrain, of course I'm going to put all kinds of obstacles that are going to make it really hard for your tanks to get through, which, oh, by the way, you're usually going to fire artillery and air assets at bad guys in urban terrain, and you should. You should be shaping the operation, the entire thing. Well, the one thing that we it's really hard to train is that as soon as we do that, we're going to create a lot of rubble, which is a trouble for any vehicle, no matter what. So you better have engineers giving you the mobility that they bring to the fight. Right. Yeah. The, um, the next thing I actually, this like works into this is that I think a lot of people don't know about, which I think you wrote a great article about, about the just again, concrete, not only is it, can it be used, or not only is it something you have to penetrate, it's also something that we found was very useful, right? How how was concrete employed in Iraq, for instance? Yes, yeah, so I wrote an article that said that concrete was the most effective weapon on the modern battlefield. Given the context of the fight that we were fighting, right, so a counterinsurgency, counterterrorism mission um, where protecting the population was so important, and where IEDs was the main fight, right? So after not long after we invaded in 2003, we're no longer fighting an armed enemy were fighting IEDs. So we started putting concrete walls, and I'm talking six-ton concrete barriers uh, along every main road in Iraq and just hundreds of miles of concrete walls, making it harder to put IEDs or roadside bombs. Um, but then we also figured out in this whole nation building, trying to bring security to urban areas that we needed to make the problem smaller. So we created safe neighborhoods which makes common sense. Uh, so we started putting concrete walls around neighborhoods that are pretty much homogeneous of 
you know, whether it's Sunni or Shia or just, you know, needed protecting. So we put walls around them, completely walling in entire neighborhoods and then putting guards at the only in and out points, which reduces an enemy's ability to, to create mass casualty events, which is what we were facing, right? Car bombs and suicide bombs. Um, if you can reduce that, you can achieve security through other measures. And in one last way we use concrete, which was during my time, and we almost is terrain denial. So in the Battle of Sadr City, it was a city of two million, and U.S. forces were told that they couldn't go inside that city within a city. So it's a city within that Baghdad. Uh, but there, the bad guys, the Jay Shah Mahdi, were coming out of their city, launching rockets into the green zone and having this massive strategic effect. So we started putting walls around Sadr City, creating a wall around well what that did we discovered was it really made them mad inside the city so they came out and started like dummies shooting at the american military which is great it did the one thing which is really hard in urban counterinsurgency is separate the bad guy from the population as soon as he steps out starts shooting at you because you're putting a wall up that he really hates and then he's you could smoke him uh and it also took away where they could fire the rockets it it took away their ability to move weapons in and out of their safe zone city. So it was actually a unique battle where we achieved our outcome with ever, without a- actually entering the city. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I remember when I went through the green zone, there, there was just T-walls, back t- just lining the streets for as far as you could see. You couldn't turn around without, freaking, oh, there's another one. They're just everywhere. There, they seemed to be lining every courtyard, every street, you, and they're, what, 12, 14 feet high. So it's just, it's kind of a sight to behold to see how much concrete they poured into these cities. Yeah, and I, and I you know, it isn't all roses, though. I mean, we've left, we left that concrete there. Right? There was no massive withdrawal plan that included taking our concrete away. Uh, so it was all left there. So, you know, flash forward, five ten years and you have major fights happening in these urban areas with isis the concrete walls oh what you should know about defending become really good obstacles because that's a six ton single wall so if you put more than one on top of each other you have like a multiple ton obstacle with concrete reinforced with steel rebar which almost nothing you shoot at it will actually clear it out of the way it, it, it became a a real tactical challenge for the Iraqi security forces later. Yeah. But another thing that we were talking about briefly was there, there's a, is, are there any good examples of battles, modern battles happening in mega cities? Or uh, I believe there was a, a battle you had mentioned. I'm sorry. Was, it, was it in Armenia? So, yeah. So I, I just finished a paper really excited about it. The, in the, the last war that, we're mostly looking at was the the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war, which happened in a piece of land nobody really recognizes it as its own country, but it's it's, it's an an area between Armenia and a- Azerbaijan that goes back since the fall of the Soviet war as a contested area. Uh, and within that, we saw the military of Azerbaijan fully modernized, especially with Turkish uh, support using drones, Turkish drones and Israeli drones to just obliterate the Armenian forces that were protecting or within as you know, the Nagorno Karabakh. And that's mostly what the, the, the news has been right. That the tank is dead. The infantrymen in the open is dead because of this ever persistent cheap amount of drones that people can put in the air. Now I'm loitering drones that we've never seen in warfare ever before is, this really little, they call them kamikaze suicide drones. I mean, they will mess you up. Uh, what I saw in the battle, though, and nobody reported on, was the strategic importance of cities. So in that war, there was one city called Susha City, which sits on a on a cliff, really, overlooking the entire area. Uh, and as it was taken in 1992 by the Armenians, well, 2020, it became really important to Azerbaijan. And it actually became the only thing that mattered. And it wasn't drones that captured it. It was ground forces that attacked the city. And they actually inserted 
400 special forces across wooded mountainous terrain, almost impassable, and that scaled cliffs up to the city to break apart the defense and allow them to seize and hold that city. And it became strategic to the war because once that city fell, the the Susha city, Armenia surrendered and actually gave up everything they had lost in the war because once that city fell, they knew that they were at danger of their entire country, their self-proclaimed country falling because they were only, not only did they have the decisive terrain as an overview of the entire area, but they were 10 kilometers from the capital, which they could just rain down artillery from within their city on the capital city and obliterate it. I think it's the missed lesson of almost the most recent battle we've ever seen. So it's kind of like a, a almost a shortcut to victory sometimes. If you can capture the right city, you can capture that correct flag and hold it, then you can sort of bypass a lot of losses that you would have faced otherwise. Is that is that kind of what? Yes. Is that the takeaway? So yeah, it, you can go down different, different. There have been cases in history where we've done you know, militaries have done that. There's a famous one with Napoleon getting to to Russia, or you know, uh, it, it didn't, doesn't create doesn't win the war. But I think you can, more cases of of that actually happen, right? So you think about our our wars, Baghdad, right? So our only mission was to remove Saddam from power. Where is the political base of power? Baghdad. So what did we do? We ran as fast as we could to get to the capital city, which was very poorly defended. Punched a hole into the middle of it and turned around and said, we own this. And and everything fell apart after that, right? Uh, In in multiple cases, and it is just a slow campaign to get to that center of political power there's wars of uh, attrition where it's yeah. just a slog fest that you're you're grinding it's like a meat grinder of a war because forces a lot of times can't get to those strategic cities and then they end up in that just back and forth and back and forth so yeah i, I see the value where if a force can punch through and and take a very important city then they can avoid that war of attrition right Right. So there's different theories, right? And every context matters. I mean, there's strong military theory uh, that, you know, all war is politics, right? So what is the political objective you're trying to achieve, right? Is it this war of survival? Is it an absolute war where literally we're trying to overthrow an entire other country? Or is it more limited, right? So there's been giant wars fought over just stopping one side from shooting rockets, especially in Israel, I want to stop you from shooting rockets at me. So I'm going to penetrate, limit an objective, reduce your ability to, to do that, and then I'm going to come out. Or am I completely trying to overthrow a country? You think Panama, you think Iraq. You, you know, I'm going to have to punch to the political center, which is the, the when you see When you look at what the IDF is doing, what, what, do you, what would your analysis sort of be of what you think their goal is? Yeah, th- you, if you work backwards sort of from their tactics – So the Israelis are, unlike any other country in the world, are on a a fight for literally survival from all directions, right? They they know that within Gaza City and in in the north that that's the likely, but history shows that they face challenges from every direction. Um, They are the world's best at what they're trying to achieve, which is protect themselves and reduce the enemy's ability to threaten them. Uh, those urban operations are limited in scope, though, right? So that if they were to to move into to Gaza, you know, what we've seen in, in this most recent 2021 operations was the intent is to stop the other military's ability to place effects on their urban areas, mainly, right? Uh, because the enemy isn't as powerful, right? Israeli military has a amazing capabilities and especially in strike capabilities in tunnel um, detection and tunnel destruction the enemy is embedded within the urban zone so he comes out of the urban zone pops off the rockets and gets back in it because this concern for civilian casualties right that's a a concern that w- that does vary um it's a part of the law of armed conflict um you know all this talk chris is also below the nuclear threshold 
so this is there's also this idea that hey we're talking about this big war against some big person that we're we're all talking about it below the nuclear threshold right i own a, a giant nuclear um capability and where will i target with my nuclear capabilities it's going to be in the economic and political centers of my enemy because that's what we think will cause them to surrender right so you can do it by land or do it by bombing although i'm an, i'm strongly against the belief of strategic bombing will convince an enemy to to come to the political table right so that's the other theory about history urban warfare. seems to support right. that that doesn't work doesn't work the uh, it, that is basically the uh, strategic bombing is the allies approach to no matter how much bombing they did it didn't really seem to push the needle towards surrender you you can actually embolden your enemies will by bombing them and, you make and, a and, lot of uh, martyrs yeah or just instill some national um bring them together as a nation you can you can do the opposite of what you're trying to do land power and that's we why saw how army... 9-11 really brought this country yeah. together yeah. and that was basically we got sort of bombed and then next thing you know the u.s is it's they're coming for you <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. If they hadn't done that, yeah, we pro the country might not have sort of come together during that time in the same way. So I, I could understand where if you're in one of those, it's really it's interesting to try to put yourself in the shoes of, uh, you know, have, have to try to think about what it would be like to be someone in one of those cities. And y you could understand where they, it, once they get strategically bombed, that they're, you're going to create, uh, it's a great, what do you call it, recruiting campaign for them. Absolutely. So you have to be able to, you know, I deal in this world of like who's going to be important in the future, right? And we're in this inner war period right now, right? Iraq and Afghanistan are over. The army is almost like an afterthought. So they're going to defund the army and increase capabilities that they think will be important in the next war, right? So we're going to build new, better Navy, better air, aircraft, better cyber and space capabilities. This is so funny because I was just reading this article about that. Basically, it was the lessons learned from the 2006 Lebanon war between Israel and Lebanon. And one of the things in this thesis paper was, it was all about how the IDF really overthought and put so much emphasis on air power at the time, because back then they thought that air power was going to negate any infantry, any tank. So they put all their resources into the new shiny tool, the new shiny special thing that everyone gets all the attention. They put all their money into and, and time into that, and then they sort of let their infantry be, de degrade. They didn't train as much. They didn't put the money into it. And then they listed that as one of the reasons as to why they didn't reach their strategic goals in that 2006 battle. So I think what we do you think people are putting all their effort, time, money into the sexy things like drones and, and cyber while forgetting some of the fundamentals here? I mean, what do you think about that? Absolutely. And I, you know, this, this is beyond me, right? So I'm only a small portion of this conversation. Um, I think that we want in, we want to fight not in urban areas where most of this stuff that isn't going to work. Right. But you can't not do it all almost. And that's what the, the, the battle of the war of Nagorno Karabakh really shows the Azerbaijanis had used oil money to modernize their military, right? Every aspect of it. And that's what you need to be a powerful military force. You can't, you know, let one portion atrophy because you believe that the next war will be, you know, a total maritime war, a total space war. Uh, it won't involve a land component. That's just silly talk. Uh, but you can't then, if you're the land component, only invest in these futuristic capabilities you think will be will be the most dominant, right? That's why the U.S. military spends the, the mo more money than you know twenty nations combined. Because if you're going to be a superpower, you have to have capabilities in all domains. Period. And, and I agree that we were falling behind in cyber capabilities with against other nations. Um, where I really get frustrated, though, is even when we imagine the land component aspect of it, we're still hung up on open terrain warfare, right? The ability to reach out and touch your enemy in long range as far as you can because you are able to see them before they saw you, and then you can put effects on them. 
yes, and, and as you get even more and more better at that, the more and more warfare will go, will focus on urban terrain, and you better have the ability to close with uh, in urban terrain and defend it, right? So nobody talks about defending urban terrain, Chris. Nobody. I can't find anybody um, because they we're an offensive based military ourselves, um, and based on the context of other militaries, they they also view as being reactive. Um, there is no battle drill def- 77 defend a building. Right. Um, <laughs> and we learned a lot, right? Even in the 20 years of Iraq and Afghanistan, we learned about how to f- protect ourselves in urban terrain. We might not have learned how to defend a whole city and what that takes, but we better because if, if this is a peer on peer conflict, uh, it will involve both attacking and defending. And when you attack, you better defend to what we say consolidate our gains. And now again, back to Nagorno Karabakh just last year, when they took that city, it was only their ability to repel some very hard counterattacks because the enemy really wanted that city back that allowed them to consolidate their gains and actually hold the, the ground. And within 24 hours of their attempted retake, they surrendered because it was over. So we have to start thinking urban a lot more than we do let's keep doing battle drill six, but let's build on that. Like, okay, now you, the context has changed and there's an enemy that knows you're coming. What's your attack of that? Let's just say a building, let alone a city plan. What do you have? Do you put any, have you thought much about the small arms used in urban fighting? Have you thought at all about the potential switch to the six, eight by 50 mil, one millimeter round? Um, and how that might, because when I test fired this new gun that the army's thinking of moving towards it, the recoil, it kicks. And not only that, but it's a bulky, it's like a, it's comparable. I would say maybe to an M14 with a real short barrel or something. It's, it's, do you see, so the IDF, for instance, they just started switching to the bull pup, like a real, it's a short gun and and the and the U.S. Army seems to be thinking almost the opposite that they're going to be trying to reach out and touch at 800 meters because they got these optics now that can take advantage of that. So I, I want to get your what do you think? A, a, is it the wrong direction? It, I know they have other smaller versions of it, but I, I don't know. What, what do you think? Yeah, and this gets you. You know more than, than I do because you've been looking at this for a lot longer. I know that many militaries are looking at this more longer range munitions. And that's makes sense. Uh, it's also hard to say that you have one weapon that all soldiers, you know, a million man army carries uh, when they may view urban as a specialized operation that will adapt to, right? So are these weapons along a kind of what I call like a spectrum of adaptability, right? We never know where we're going to fight. We're imagining again, this long, being able to touch somebody far out, we need longer distance, both in our small arms and our machine guns. Um, if I'm going to fight an urban fight, I need, I need, I don't need counterterrorism, short range, uh, entering clear of room, better weapons. I think you need somewhere in the middle of that long range, better penetration weapon. Yeah, um, so that's what they're hoping is that that yeah. six eight will because. Uh, something I, I like to talk about is how there's a sort of a few things that have that are military paradigm shifts that have come out in sort of the last 20 years. You got night vision, you got uh, body armor, which are now they're they're prolific. Everyone has these things and going into and fighting in a room with the enemy that has body armor is very different than going in fighting an enemy without body armor. That's why I think we see the MP5, that submachine gun sort of falls out of favor because the nine millimeter indoors close combat, it's not, people feel as though it's not going to cut it anymore. Um, yeah, I would like people to get, just have a better, people as, as in our rotational military force to have a better idea of what their weapons will actually do given different contexts of fighting in urban terrain, right? So there's some operations where I don't want my weapons penetrating multiple walls because of civilian casualties there are other operations where i want i want to be able to stand that back as far as i can and i know he's in there and to penetrate him uh, and that's where we don't right so you know how much mortars are we investing in mortar capabilities as well at the, the infantry level the artillery 
what munitions from smoke, right? I, I think I told you where major fight in, in the Battle of Mosul, and they ended up having to use artillery white phosphorus, which is awesome. I love Willie P. Shake and bake. Uh, it's really bad if you fire it in urban terrain, especially when civilians are present. When you wanted, you really wanted smoke, but you had defunded your strategic supply so much that there wasn't artillery smoke in the entire CENTCOM AOR, which should have taught you a giant lesson. So you're saying they didn't have enough con- um, smoke rounds to fire on the city for concealment? Correct. They didn't have any to con- to to in Just our support. It wasn't routine. in their arsenal. It wasn't in the in the strategic supply of what we call prepositioned stock. You know, what they had on hand. Your know, a- aspect of it. Um, so they they needed to and conceal. Why specifically would for someone who maybe isn't as familiar? Why would you really want a lot of smoke uh, during urban? Yeah, so I wrote an article about the, the, these eight rules of urban warfare that I think are present, especially in a high-intensity fight, and especially if you're attacking, right? The, 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 the defender can see you coming from a mile away and can put rounds on you from a mile away. You may not even know it, right? There's remote-controlled sniper weapons now. The, the, the biggest advantage that a defender has is he can see you coming. Um, if you're the attacker, you need the ability to conceal your movement. And the biggest thing we have in the modern day is smoke. And we know that, um, but the best thing we have in our, especially in our close combat formations, is a is a hand grenade smoke that pops and gives you about thirty seconds if you know which way the wind's blowing. As you and I know, like you throw that smoke and it's basically useless. Um, but how many times am I going to need to be able to get to close the distance? Um, in what that one operation, they, they, they were trying to save a hospital with you know lots of civilians being held hostage, and they needed the ability to cross major highways without just being obliterated. Um, so you needed massive amounts of smoke. And we don't have that capability in our military anymore. We used to have it on our vehicles, on our mechanized vehicles and our armor, where you it basically dumped the diesel onto the manifolds and create massive amounts of smoke. You know, most people think that the little smoke grenades on our vehicles does something, and that's literally like a one-shot, one-kill thing that we have to conceal the vehicle itself. I'm talking about concealing the, the moving formations that are trying to move on the enemy, right? Combine arms maneuver. It's what we do. Uh, we don't, we have a smoking problem. <laughs> and they, they don't seem to be investing the money in fixing that. Then. No, absolutely not. And so you go to a lot of these uh, NTC training events, correct, right? And uh, what sense do you get from those training events? That Yeah, so I try to get out as much training much operational units as possible because you can kind of get separated in academics and just studying things Um, but you you and i know that there's there's a reality of what people actually have today what they're using how they're going to fight versus amazing things we have going on in modernization right new new replacement for m4 replacement for the bradley replacement for all these things but there's a reality of what's on the ground i like to go out and see that and then see how we're training urban operations especially at, at our combat training centers where we Spend, we have spent a lot of money building amazing. And we have an urban site in NTC, which is the biggest in our inventory, right? The biggest urban site in the U.S. military. Uh, and I go out and watch. But we're so challenged by even replicating the reality of urban combat, right? So the way we fight, we train fighting is through 1970s technology called MILES, right? So laser tag. What laser tag can't do is it can't go through even a plywood board. Uh, and that's so when it's, it's, when it's working. When you get that yeah. system up and working, <laughs> right? which you, uh, you are a magician if you can get miles to work. <laughs> right. And they have miles on the vehicles. Um, what do you think of the sim munitions? Sim munitions are good. Um, it, again, it, urban operations is not an infantryman's fight. It's a combined arms fight. So if I can't simulate dropping a mortar round on the bad guy, I know that's in front of me. Or if I can't simulate an artillery smoke round coming in without a guy driving up in a pickup truck and turning on a button. Uh, Do you see any value in these virtual reality headsets? They're, they're talking about that's going to be the future of training and where they yeah. could possibly uh, implement things like that. Yeah, I don't, in- I'm not a fan of um, what we call synthetic environments to train close combat skills, right? So infantrymen moving forward dealing with all the cognitive load that is urban combat, right? Knowing that I could be shot from any direction at any moment, um, being able to control maneuvering forces while I call in fire, all that. 
I, I hate people trying to replicate that in the aesthetic environment. I do think it, it will give leaders the ability to look at urban terrain, to do mission planning, uh, to do vehicle movement, right? So some of our biggest time the U.S. military got their asses kicked was because they couldn't maneuver through urban terrain to get to the objective. Think about Black Hawk Down. Think about uh, actually Solder City 2004, where we can we get we can get confused about the urban terrain because it, it becomes so overloading just to drive through uh, and and to navigate through in real time. I think synthetic environments can do that for us. Synthetic environments can do so much on understanding the city that we don't even think about in our military planning. Uh, I I just hate people thinking that if you play Call of Duty, you're going to get better at war fighting. Because if that was true, we'd have Navy SEALs, infantry privates by now. Yeah. And some of them, I think, do think of themselves that way. <laughs> right. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, I think a lot of people aren't maybe aren't aware of, is th- there's the way that they do urban operations or r- clear room in uh, the UK is a little bit different. C- can you explain what their philosophy is? So... Yeah, you you did a little bit of research on this, and I thought I actually found it interesting. And I reached out again to my UK guys to make sure I'm 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 straight. They have different terms, right? So they they call what we used to call mount. We don't use that term anymore. We call it urban operations. We we eliminated because officers need OER blocks. Um, they call it FIBU, a fighting in build up areas. Um, they also view CQB as the foundation for their urban operations. But you can find that they also work to expand on that, right? To, to work on different contexts of how you can pie off. It's just building blocks on the four man stack entering the room. Um, and we don't, they work on more, I would say, I'll give them credit more on urban interior movements than we often get to like right? we're, you know, by the time we, we view everything outside of that door permissible. So we'll just run up to the door and start working on our CQB drills where they'll work harder on that hallway clearance, that it's an open door, pieing it off. Those aspects that I think you've seen in different training videos, but they do follow, uh, they don't call it battle drill six, but they have a battle drill six. And if you watch different elements, you, you like they're doing the same things we are. What interested me about what I saw, and maybe I got the wrong sense of it, but it yeah. seemed as though they were doing a little bit more methodical of room clearing, a little more, not necessarily, hey, everyone, let's just pile, let's just clown car into this room, a little bit more like, oh, sh- maybe I'll peek in first. Maybe I'll, I'll look inside and see if, dip my toe in the water, see if it's freezing cold or not. Um, but... I guess it sounds like they, they do also have the Russian Battle Drill 6 one as well. But it would be nice to see if the if the U.S. military could implement some kind of just, hey, we don't necessarily always have to just rush into... I mean, the, the raids that I did surprisingly went v- very much by the book where everyone did just rush into every room and it was shouting and yelling and violence of action. But maybe there is more of a, a slow way that it could be done. I think that's, it, Chris is a great point. And I think it's a really good reflection of the, the UK does have an urban operations school. It's called the urban operations instructor course where they start off at CQB, but they have multiple weeks of how to platoon operation considerations, how to, man, how to move with armor or mobile protective firepower in the urban train to get to your objective. Um, multiple scenarios that are different contexts than just a counterterrorism raid. Um, and we do not have that, right? So the only thing the U.S. military have is within our special operations community, we have an urban shooting and breaching course. Uh, we, are, we have an urban course for our engineers called the Urban Mobility Breachers Course that we actually just cut funding for, so it's going away. So we're we're actually going away from it, but we need – expertise in urban operations, right? So I need people that can train our close combat forces on the different scenarios and different considerations. Um, it, it, it's a big topic, but I think that's one of the reflections is that the, the UK actually has a course in urban operations. Sometimes I think that the US military can be held back sometimes by the fact that it's so large 
the UK army, I think we were just talking about how it's been downsized yet again. And when you're a smaller military force, it might have some advantages of being able to move quicker with some uh, training philosophies or, you know what I mean? Like the US army, they have to do everything at, at scale of millions and millions of soldiers. So it might be harder for them to implement a new urban warfare training like how the UK might be able to. Yeah, you're spot on. And there's also, yeah, we're, we're a superpower. We know that we have to be ready to, to fight and win in any environment, right? So I, 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 give, my, I give us credit, right? So we're, we're having to train for, whether you're talking about the jungles of the Philippines or the urban centers of China or island hopping, uh, we have to train for it all. And other militaries have decided to take risk and not do that, right? We haven't. We can't. Uh, I just think that one of our places that we could spend more time on is urban because it is the future. Well, thank you very much for your, um, well, first let me see, is there anything you'd like to specifically a link maybe that I'll, I can put in the description to send people towards? Yeah. I mean, um, we have the urban warfare project at the modern war Institute, which is a, a website our, our outward facing thing where we publish an article, a video or a podcast every every day uh, i'm lead of the urban warfare project which is a subcomponent of that so if you go to that website you'll see every article and podcast i have a podcast every two weeks um where i'm just wrestling with all these different various topics of urban operations well it's really it's a fascinating subject i feel like urban warfare is something that for me it's one of the most interesting parts of warfare it gets a lot of attention um probably because of how it's considered to be one of the most challenging um, parts of warfare. So I, I really I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing all of the, the knowledge that you have on this topic. Um, I'm excited for us to speak again sometime in the future. Uh, and there was, was there anything else that you wanted to, to add? No, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's been an honor and a great pleasure. Uh, you know, I have a dream job, and this is a part of that.